Okay, so welcome everybody to this session of what makes the best ecosystem for, which we're recording as part of the on-demand viewing for the on Helix conference coming up, uh, which is going to be live next week, but this will be available for delegates right the way through the event and, and also then for four weeks after. So it's a great chance for people watching these recordings to look at if they're making decisions about where to put their company, where to grow, where to work, they get an idea of what the dynamic is and what's going on in those different locations, as well as us collectively discussing what are some of the key challenges that you want to, to be addressed by the ecosystem. And today's session, I'm grateful for such a great panel of, of varying insights and roles to come together, because we're gonna be looking at you know, what, what's a great ecosystem for building the team for a science company. Accepting it's not all about lab work, it's not all about the corporate side, but it's actually putting the whole team together and what ecosystems work for that and, and maybe what's important. So as Tony Jones and, and Chief Executive of One Nucleus, it's my pleasure to host such an expert group in front of me. Um, so with that, I shall hand over and maybe ask Brad if you'd like to introduce yourself and give us a, a sense of why you think is great where you are. Thanks, Tony, I appreciate that. So my name is Brad Stewart. I'm uh, with the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation. And Montgomery County is located in Maryland, just adjacent to Washington, D.C. It's uh, considered the fourth largest biotech ecosystem in the United States. So we're very fortunate in a lot of ways. We have the National Institutes of Health located here, uh, the FDA. We have a large number of uh, global pharmaceutical companies with operations here like GlaxoSmithKline and AstraZeneca and a significant number of cell therapy companies. And uh, uh, it's been estimated that the state of Maryland has about 25% of the vaccine development um, thought leaders in the world located here. Uh, people like Novavax and GSK's global vaccine headquarters are here. So a very interesting place. Um, myself, I've spent about 30 years now in the life sciences uh, world, about 25 of that uh, here in Maryland. And um, almost all of that as an executive on the commercial side, running commercial stage uh, life sciences co companies on a global scale. My most re recent company was uh, we did all the manufacturing here in Maryland, but we're commercial in 18 countries around the world. And so in addition to my current job, I also chair the Maryland Life Sciences Organization, which is the uh, uh, Maryland state affiliate of the International Bio Organization. Thanks, Brad. Professor, I'll come to Ian next. Hi, so my name is, is Ian Waddle, and I'm the CSO of the early discovery part of Charles River. So Charles River, as most of you probably heard of, is a large end-to-end -end CRO, and we, we deliver right across the range of drug discovery all the way out to towards the clinic. The part that I'm most involved in is really the, the drug discovery part. Uh, and we have a number of different sites, but they are all pretty similar in that they tend to be near a biohub. So the one I'm sat at, Today is on Chesterford Park, close to, close to Cambridge, and really it's vital for us in terms of retention of staff, in terms of, of recruiting staff to be located close to a biohub that contains actually a plethora of different companies. So from biotech companies, startup companies, through to big pharma like AstraZeneca. So a little bit more about me. So a bit like Brad, I've spent slightly more than 30 years in, in this industry, uh, 20 of which were spent in big pharma. So I, I went through the ranks at AstraZeneca, pretty much always on oncology. So I'm an expert in oncology. Uh, ended up mainly doing translational science. I then switched for seven years to working for a charity, again, all so Cancer Research UK, again, always doing drug discovery. And then I joined Charles River about four years ago, initially as the, the head of biology. So looking after about, it's now 350 biologists spread on now six sites. Uh, and one of the reasons I joined Charles River was, was actually to get involved in, in a broader landscape of of drug discovery, which often surprises people when they hear that in terms of a CRO. Hey, excellent. Um, Sarah. 
Uh, sure, thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Niemann. I am the Manager for International Affairs at uh, Life Science Nord. We are a cluster organization, um, so basically um, an entity that, that facilitates uh, contacts within the life science industry in uh, northern Germany. So we do represent the two northernmost um, states in Germany, which are Hamburg and Schleswig-Holstein. Um, so basically everything up until Scandinavia. Um, we represent um, as a cluster organization, roughly um, 500 companies, research organizations, universities, uh, clinics, um, and, and uh, the like. Um, and that basically spanning both biotech, medtech, um, but also pharma from startups to uh, large companies like um, Olympus, for instance, has their um, European headquarters here or Philips or um, you know, other, other companies as well. So a very diverse group um, of life science uh, players, I want to say. Um, and as we're talking today about the um, yeah, building kind of science teams and, and uh, recruitment um, also in, in that sense, um, I think we're very fortunate to be, um, I want to say, a feedback provider to also the university system that we have. Um, so there are eight universities connected to life science in our region. Um, and um, so we um, kind of, as this connecting factor, can provide feedback from industry to, uh, to universities um, and then provide, um, you know, assistance in, in building future, future courses. Yep. Thank you for having us. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Very excited to be part of uh, the panel with you guys today. So my name is Mathieu Viss from Provence Promotion. We also use the name uh, Invest in Provence. That is more obvious. This is our trademark. So we're an investment promotion agency based in the south of France, in Provence, in Marseille, exactly. So we're very lucky to be on the Mediterranean Sea, but we have also a large uh, bio cluster with about 400 uh, companies here in the south of France. And we, as Provence Promotion, we support uh, both French and foreign companies investing in a region. And when thinking at um, what we do now, because we have six sectors of excellence, but we've been narrowing now to three uh, priorities after the, the COVID uh, crisis. I mean, within this recovery plan that we are now uh, uh, supporting. And uh, among the three priorities, uh, health tech is, uh, is, one, uh, is the, the first one we started. It has been supported by the metropolitan area with a 1.3 billion euro investment within the coming years. So this is definitely important here. And we, have, we are lucky to have um, originally um, the second concentration of research in life science in the south of France. We have also uh, a large number of hospitals, meaning that um, we can have access to trials for, for foreign companies investing here in the region. And finally, um, we are not a region where uh, big pharma, large companies originally invested. So most of the health tech startups or companies we have here they uh, were originally uh, launched in the late uh, 20th century, so in the 90s. So it's a quite a, a young cluster, but with uh, uh, um, lots of dynamism. Uh, we are land of, of entrepreneurship. That's really uh, is uh, characterizing the southern France. And based on that, uh, this is a growing cluster. And we, uh, as an investment promotion agency, we are also building uh, internationally relationships, net um, connections with other clusters around the world. So for example, in the US with uh, Biocom in San Diego, uh, we, have, uh, we have also been working in, with Japan, with the JBA. Uh, we are twin city with Hamburg. So <laughs> I had, had the chance to meet Sa a couple of years ago uh, uh, it's a different position, but uh, definitely Hamburg is of uh, high interest for, for Marseille and southern France. And um, about myself very shortly, so I've been um, working uh, within the biotech and medtech industry for the past uh, 20 years. I had the chance to supervise the biotech sector, health tech sector at Provence Promotion. Uh, and then I had um, a short experience within a recruiting company. And now I'm back into this uh, economic development world, 
but in charge of international relations and also the overall strategy uh, of the agency. So I, 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 probably I will comment more about um, talents and, and the way we can attract talents yeah, and, and the priorities uh, when thinking about how to build a science company. Mm. It's okay for you, Tony. Yeah. Excellent. We'll, we'll come back. And uh, Nile, thank you. Great. Thank you, Tony. So, yeah, delighted to be here with this uh, panel of experts uh, from, from across the world, as usual. Um, I look forward to a, an, an excellent conversation. So, uh, by way of introduction, my name is Niall Kerrigan, and I'm the Business Development Manager for the Life Sciences Sector Portfolio uh, with an organization called Calgary Economic Development. Um, you know, so very similar to Matthew, Calgary Economic Development is an investment promotion agency for the, the city of Calgary, Alberta in Canada. And so we're uh, the fourth largest city in, in Canada, a uh, population of about 1.4 million people um, nestled up against the, the Rocky Mountains in, 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 in Alberta in Canada, in Western Canada. And so our, our city has been undergoing a fairly rapid uh, economic diversification uh, process over the last number of years, transitioning you know, away from some of our more traditional economic engines and life sciences and, and health technology has been identified as a key area, as an emerging area for sustainable growth into the future. And it's really built on the backs of our tremendous research and development uh, potential that we have and activity that we have at our university here in the city, and as well as the unique healthcare environment that uh, the province of Alberta has, and that it's the only um, healthcare environment in Canada that's uh, integrated at the provincial level for the entire population of 4.4 million people here. So it's quite a unique environment for healthcare innovation. And we're really seeing uh, a real good cluster of companies come up uh, and really start to make some advancement in, in those areas. And so Calgary's home to um, over 120 companies in, in life sciences innovation. Uh, everything from small startups to large publicly traded companies call, call our city home. Uh, and so, you know, I'm really uh, delighted to, to weigh in on the panel here, maybe bring a bit of a different flavor on what, um, you know, the, some of the challenges and barriers that exist to the early stages of an emerging ecosystem. I think they can be quite different uh, than some of the more established ecosystem in terms of the talent requirements and the talent recruitment challenges and the traction um, barriers and stuff like that. But I think it also the opportunities for companies uh, to maybe make investments in uh, regions that have an emerging cluster and have maybe a, a, a supply of talent that's not quite as competitive, I think are quite different than some of the other sectors. So uh, really looking forward to the, uh, the the discussion today, Tony. Yeah, thanks, Niall. I'm, I'm sort of, I say I'm pleased with the sort of mix of perspective here, I think, because I, you know, sort of Brad and Annie and I sort of looking at you two from that sort of commercial side of building teams and companies and, and have them and, and keep them. So I guess maybe I'll, I'll come to, to you first and I'll come to Ian first and, and then to Brad. You know, what do you think, you know, how big a factor when a Charles River then decides oh, we need to expand our teams and grow, how much does, can we recruit the right workforce play in that decision? It's absolutely vital. So it's, it's especially in the areas that we want to grow. So, I, you know, it, it goes back to the, the the debate about you know where is a great site to, to or, or home to build a business, mm. uh, it, particularly in life science. And to me, it, it, it's it's the balance between retention and recruiting. So if mm. I if I think of of you know the sites that we're growing on, and we can talk about Cambridge, and we can talk about both Cambridges, the Cambridge in Massachusetts and the mm. Cambridge in the UK, the issues are exactly the same. The biggest threat to us is retention, but counterbalance to that, the biggest benefit to us is that there is a wealth of talent around to actually recruit. And very often it's the only place where we can recruit niche expertise. Mm. And I know we might go on to talk about it in, in it as a different art, of this discussion, but having access to a really high quality university is, is absolutely vital from, from a recruitment point mm. of view. But I, I would go one level more specific, and I would say actually having access to 
a teaching hospital, which is not something I ever thought that I would say. But as we become more attuned to personalised medicine and more thinking about biomarker development, recruiting people with enough disease knowledge and enough ability to think about patient demands is, is actually becoming very limiting for us. And that, that's why we tend to focus in these in these biohub areas. So that was a very long answer. Tony. No, no, I think it, you've raised some really interesting points, I think, because I guess when I was thinking, you know, we think about the sort of academia industry bit and, and often my thought process defaults to where are these lab scientists going to come from or, or scientists. Teaching hospitals, I didn't really know. But, but Brad, I mean, you've similarly built teams and, and exited companies and, and or got them to a point to be able to exit. Um, does that resonate with you as well in terms of your experience of, of how to create those teams? I, I think Ian hit a lot of important points there. So I, I spent 25 years here in an ecosystem watching it evolve forward, fortunately. And uh, it, I will fully admit it was incredibly painful <laughs> 20 years ago. Um, and I think Ian hit some of the key points. I, I come from the commercial uh, side of the world and there were very few people like me in this area. So there was always a difficulty finding people with that experience. And uh, I'm clearly biased, but I think it's important to incorporate that commercial stage thinking pretty early in the process of development to make sure you have a product you can actually sell and bring to market that's clinically valuable. But um, another point Ian mentioned is the skill sets. Um, these are highly complex skill sets that we're typically looking for, and they're not uh, ones you can easily take someone off the street that was doing something else and help them understand the importance and the criticality of our QA systems, our QC systems, um, the importance of following an SOP and understanding how and why those SOPs are developed. Um, it's possibly easier. We've taken people, you know, with bachelor's degrees and uh, science, you know, in their early stage career and trained them, uh, but they've had, you know, significant laboratory experience before that. But it, even that's a pretty significant change to, uh, you know, the type of work that we do. And I, I think, you know, Sarah had an important point in her opening. Um, it, to do that, not only do you have to sort of get that, that ball rolling somewhere, you have to have a, a base of people with that skill set in a, a company or two where you can start to train them and build them. And as Ian pointed out, you trade them. Uh, you know, mm. People move back and forth and skills do. But then it's being able to work with your uh, universities and other, we have a wonderful um, two-year college here that also does uh, programs to certify workers, but sitting down with them and being able to communicate, you know, what skill sets you actually need um, and sort of modifying what they're teaching people so that they're more productive coming out. So I, I think there's quite a bit there that, that helps. It's tough starting out, uh, but it's it's really hard to to get mm. to that point where you have that sort of natural uh, ability to grow companies. Well, I guess that's it. Comes back nicely, Sarah, to your point, really, about that feedback loop that goes on between the the university and the training providers, if you like, education providers, and what the industry needs. How, how does that kind of work in practice? For you? How does that interface kind of happen? I know in the UK, we have all sorts of working groups and saying, well, this is what the industry needs, but that's not a viable course for universities. And, and we try and get the policy right. But I'm sort of, I'm sure it'd be interesting for others as well to hear how that engagement you have or you see your colleagues having in the cluster with the universities to get the talent pipeline up. You were addressing that to Ian, correct? No, to you. Oh, to me, to me. Sorry, yeah. I didn't hear it in the beginning. Okay, so basically um, what we do as a cluster is we have regular conversations with um, with the company. So um, it happens, you know, sometimes if you, if you reach out to them specifically for that, sometimes it's not specifically in these times where you can, mm -hmm. you know, get together at events, but, you know, pr prior to that. Um, so basically you, at some point you hear about the needs and the difficulties and some shortages. And uh, I wish I had, and I wish I could recruit these types and that types of, of people. Um, there's, so there's 
a specific skill set for universities to to um, kind of to educate, but perhaps to add um, a little bit of an additional perspective that I think is specific to Germany is that um, not all life science, um, I want to say, um, specialists come out of universities for us. So we do have a very strong um, apprenticeship model, um, which is, um, you know, usually you have a certain type of um, school um, school you know, like a few months that you spend in school, but the most work and education that you get is in labs specifically. So, um, so for lab technicians, for instance. Um, so that adds kind of a little bit of a complexity to it because you can't really plan for that. Um, you need, you always need labs that cooperate. And I think it goes very much into the direction what Brad just pointed out with the two year degree. Um, so you always need this kind of practical work that people can do as part of the education. So I think what we can do as a cluster is to just gather where there's a need, where there's a shortage. And usually we hear it a lot with these lab technicians where you have this, you can't just produce them out of universities where you have like these big capacities, but you have this limiting factor of needing lab time um, to, to get to your, to your education. And um, so what we can do is kind of, you know, get this information early, make sure that we address it both with the universities for the degrees that they have and also with um, with these providers of the apprenticeships for labs. Um, in, in our case, for instance, um, big providers of that are the university clinics that we have. So they have like their own school of life sciences then um, where they teach um, these kind of courses. Um, and so be in touch with them early on and, and make sure that um, the needs are, um, are indicated, I would mm. say. Okay, no. Yeah, just wanted to to yeah emphasize the importance of what what Sarah was saying uh, to the, the talent development pipelines in our region is the uh, yeah the the work integrated learning opportunities that our uh, educational institutions um, provide. It's baked into um, I think every single program, no matter whether your life your science uh, STEM engineering or 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 other programs uh, here, and that not only provides a um, affordable uh, steady talent stream for our companies in our region but also you know encourages the thinking among students to maybe consider positions in industry where they're where you know if they didn't have those integrated learning opportunities they may have you know gone through a trajectory towards academia or other professional schools so that really encourages that leap uh, for those students to to make into the industry here and then just wanted to also mention um uh, one unique program uh, that we have ongoing in our region here um, is to sort of manage the mismatch between the, uh, I guess, the skills that were originally developed in our uh, energy industry here in our region and trying to retrain them to um, match the skills that are required in our tech industry and life sciences included in that. So there's a considerable amount of thought leadership and, and working groups uh, between the economic development agencies, uh, the universities and industry to develop programs, not only for um, uh, students, uh, and, but for uh, industry professionals that may be displaced in their work and aligning their skills. Um, and to give an example, the sort of chemical engineering skills that are were developed in uh, response to the, the energy industry requirements mm. here align very well with, you know, the chemical synthesis skills that some of our uh, biochemists have been uh, are, are in need of in the biochemistry positions that are in need in our region. So mm -hmm. programs like that, that have government support as well, I think just adds a, another um, avenue for, for talent mm -hmm. acquisition. I, I'd, I'd like to come back on that crossover of sectors in a little bit. So I want to come to you, that year because you, you mentioned that, that sort of word of entrepreneurship and the dynamic culture. You know, and often when you're building a company, you kind of want people to be innovative, but sometimes that's the hardest team to manage because they've got too many ideas and yet they don't generally follow SOPs because they're thinking about doing it a different way or better. How does that play into building a company as opposed to starting, do you think? What do you observe there in those? So maybe I'm not answered directly to a question, but I will answer uh, in this position of investment promotion agency, I'm giving you an example. We are supporting a company that is uh, arriving from Singapore. So the company has been supported there by ASTAR and they are now expanding in Europe. They will open an R&D center, uh, a EU headquarter here in Provence. 
And uh, the main issue at the beginning is to um, find the appropriate uh, CEO, the, the right person that will uh, take this position, this role of CEO, and that will really start the business here. So here, I think this is key uh, to have, uh, like I said before, this um, ecosystem of uh, uh, entrepreneur-based um, companies. So I, I've already in mind a couple of um, people I know in the area that could take this role, and this will be definitely a, a good way for them to for this comp for this Singapore company to to accelerate the business here. So in in our role as a uh, yeah economic development agency, we really uh, can accelerate um, international expansion from companies that are investing in Provence by uh, finding the, the, the right person. So this is key mm -hmm. business. Another point that I would like to add here is that um, the challenge of mobility. Um, sometimes the people are coming here with a family, with their spouse. So, and we have developed um, a specific offer uh, so that we can really help them find the right school. Uh, we will have a new international public school in 2024 with over 3,000 students. It will be huge for the region. It's the second public international schools. We have also other private schools, but uh, we'll have this um, public school. And um, definitely uh, the fact that the Provence region is, um, uh, how to say, is really uh, pushing hard to, to become the leading region in terms of uh, new international sections uh, that they are opening in, in all the schools all around the, the metropolitan area. Uh, I think this is really important. And also um, what we have been um, developing in terms of uh, uh, um, kind of uh, toolkit set with, with a, a brochure that is describing the different areas where you can live here in Aix-Marseille Provence. So you can better understand uh, what are the different neighborhoods and, and what are the specificities. This is also really important for, for, for the, the people arriving here. And we have also um, uh, something called Be Welcome in Provence. That is uh, um, something that will help uh, the, the family to, to, to establish here in Provence to find a job. So this is really something uh, that is um, uh, quite easy to, uh, to use for, for newcomers. Mm. And I think this is also key mobility for uh, investors, for international investors. I guess, you know, when I'm thinking as you're, you're chatting and, and reflecting on some of the other comments, you know, the, the level of, of individual in terms of qualification and we're training, if they're coming in from an apprenticeship and, and they're, local to begin with, you know, that becomes more and more specialized and less and less open, I guess, to some degree. So you're then going to have to start recruiting sort of maybe more experienced and senior team leaders from elsewhere. So, I mean, I'm going to sort of look at you in a little bit here and, and where, do you, where do you think that balance is, you know, is it easier to nurture and develop the staff where they are? Or is it a healthy thing to be recruiting in from outside? Or do you need a bit of both to keep dynamic? Okay. I think you've answered it. You definitely need a bit of both. You definitely need a bit of both. And that's, that's, that for me is really about challenging thinking. So it's really about bringing some energy to the discussion and the diversity mm -hmm. of thought. So I, I would always strongly advocate a mix between growing internally uh, and, and bringing people in from the outside. But, but on the point that you're talking about, I, I just, I, I really resonated with what Sarah was saying and what Niall was saying. And I, I, if I could change one thing about the United Kingdom, it would be the pejorative use of the word technician. You know, they are the absolute heart of what we do. They're the absolute mm. core of what we do. And really we, we train them. So we've got a fantastic, apprenticeship scheme and we've got a, a graduate training scheme, but really we have that because it's the only way we can get really good technical mm. staff. It's not necessarily the ideal choice. It's, it's what we do in, in response mm. to the situation we find ourselves in. Mm. Uh, but for 
and I, I, I was about well, God, I was about to use it in a pejorative sense myself. But but for some of the more specialised roles, uh, I, I think I would always advocate a balance between training people internally, but also recruiting skills in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know where, where where we're really struggling at the moment is is to be really obvious is 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 informatics in its broadest sense mm -hmm. uh, as the industry heads more towards artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, pretty much bioinformaticians and computer aided drug design experts can pretty much write their own check i think everybody is desperate for them and and living in a in a in a bio hub, and you know mm. it's true of it's true of both Cambridges, it's true of South San Francisco. I even think of my colleagues in in the Netherlands, where we're, we're still struggling to recruit these these real experts. Uh, but I do think Europe, and I you know if I was to use my colleagues at Arlida site, they have a much healthier view of people with technical skills. So that's mm. that was a slightly controversial. No, I don't think that resonates a lot with me. I think because we, for a long time, you know, in the UK, uh, I'm would be interested what what happened elsewhere because we kind of focused so much on academic qualifications that vocational training became some sort of second class route or citizen. Absolutely. Status. Yeah. But uh, how does that play out with you, Brad, in in Montgomery? Is that a technical? skills and training valued as much as the academic qualification there? We're trying to change that. Um, I, I think you see a difference in the maturity of companies and how they value that. You know, as, as companies get larger, they can have a more uh, diverse cross-section of workforce that's working there. And we had a discussion about this recently and included three of the larger companies here. I mean, they're you know, a thousand plus employees. Um, and they, they say they continually work to try and bring down some of the requirements to even high school level if, if possible. You know, it's how do we continue to um, evolve so we can attract a, a broader, more diverse workforce um, and get more people into doing those jobs mm. uh, and get them trained and have systems in place to train them and those sorts of things. I do see, quite honestly, I mean, we have a... Um, a huge number of PhDs and postdocs and people here because of the National Institutes of Health and those sorts of things. I will be quite honest, I'd be interested to see if Ian and other people see this, um, a predisposition to believing that you, you need people with exceptionally skilled and specific scientific skills, which is true. I, I think there is that case with, you know, the smaller the company is sort of the probably more overtrained you need people because they need to be able to do more things. Um, but we still see that bias today where, where companies may want to hire someone who is a finished their postdoc and in reality another company might be able to do that same job as someone with a bachelor's degree. Um, so we do we do see that um, and again I think sometimes it's just maturity of the company that makes that change. Well, that's interesting. I think and I think it is that fact where I'm hearing more and more from companies that key need for those technical skills that generally is, I suppose, less likely to, to move. I think they tend to put down roots and then they, mm. they stay where they are to some degree. Um, but Niall, I guess, what's that situation in Calgary? As you said, you know, it's a sort of a younger emerging thing as in sort of diversified. How, how's that viewed there? Yeah, so I'd say our, our talent pool, um, you know, just because they, we have a, a strong history of a strong um, health and life sciences R&D institution here at our local university and um, at our sort of um, neighbors up the road in, in Edmonton and Alberta. So there's always been, I think, a strong talent pipeline um, of highly trained students and potentially overqualified students available to, to our industry. And what's, I think, in, in more demand now and just strictly due to the maturity of the, the ecosystem is those individuals that have that scientific qualification, that, that minimum that they need, but with the industrial experience and, you know, particularly the experience in going through the health innovation journey more than one time and, you know, recycling that talent back through to the, some of the younger companies is I think where the growing pains is as, a, as an ecosystem right now. You know, fortunately, uh, as an emerging ecosystem, um, the retention isn't as much of a challenge. I, I think that that sort of skews it the other way, where, 
you know, um, once you recruit companies, recruit staff here, they tend to stay here uh, long term and stay in those positions for quite a long time. So the investments into the talent in, from our companies is, is very uh, high reward. Um, we're also in a, in a very fortunate position as a region and uh, it's, it's in a very easy um, jurisdiction to attract talent to. It's a you know, very high quality of life uh, and you know, very uh, easy and conducive immigration processes for um, companies to recruit that external talent in. Uh, and so we are seeing, you know, a net new, I guess, addition of talent to our region that way, as well as the uh, talent coming through our, our university. But I'd say that's that's kind of the um, it, the the sort of the, the challenges that exist for an emerging sector is really that uh, having that strong talent, scientific talent combined with the industrial experience and the experience of going through the gauntlet of um, developing a, a health innovation through the cycle more than one time, which is just so critical to making it happen again. Hmm. And, and Sarah, I've always had an impression, I guess, from the outside looking, that, that Germany kind of values the technical skills and and, and yeah. workforce perhaps more than than we've been you know, we've been guilty of not valuing. I don't know whether that's a, mm, a solid I was, assumption. <laughs> I was very uh, like uh, what Brad just said. It, it really resonated with me that you know, like just this looking towards being overqualified and being you know towards the always the highest degree. I think. To some extent, we've been fortunate that this apprenticeship system has been in place for I don't know how many decades. So this is something that I think I grew up with, my parents grew up with. So this was something that was always always highly regarded. And in not just in life science, of course, but in, in any kind of industry, we always had this dual system. And only, I want to say, a rather small percentage went on to university. That has changed recently. So there is mm. more of a, like a shift towards academia, which is not a bad thing, not at all. But um, I'm curious to see how this is going to evolve in the next 10 15 years if perhaps this you know this apprenticeship is getting a little bit out of passion i don't know um but we will have to see um one thing i wanted to add actually to you i think ian said that in the very beginning how um important you know talent retention is and sometimes it's hard to find that that niche position that one person um and if you want to attract that person from the outside in i think it's always very like it's easier to to recruit that person if they know they are coming into a very broad ecosystem. So if they go to a place where there's just one company that they could potentially work for, it's a harder move to do with if especially if you move with your family and everybody else. Um, and particularly now that um, and you mentioned it as well that that the positions get so interdisciplinary that you need more IT people now in in life sciences and and other you know skills is. Um, perhaps it's good to have an ecosystem that's not just one industry but has actually a breadth of like different mm -hmm. different potentials where you can you know recruit from like you know one one part from the other so i guess that's um that's that's also interesting to see how the next five to ten years are mm -hmm. are going to develop and i guess that part of the challenge isn't it really is changing so fast that we're not even sure what the jobs are in five, <laughs> five or ten years time is going to be. but matthew coming to you and I think that that bit in terms of looking forward and I suppose supporting that economic growth and, and predicting what skills the businesses are going to need. You know, you know, we're seeing life sciences needs more digital skills and, and bioinformatics and data analysis. How do you feel the life science sector can kind of sell itself to those sorts of people? Perhaps how do we attract them compared to them going off into banking or gaming? Mm -hmm. how, how, does it, how do you position that? That's a good question. Um, we have been working, um, particularly after the COVID crisis, on you know um, CSR um, how to respond to um, CSR objectives within companies, so corporate for uh, uh, responsibility. Uh, we have more and more companies, um, also executives that are. Uh, not only presenting their business case, what they want to do in terms of business, but have also questions about how to address the CSR within our territory. So I think here this can also be a way to attract talents. Uh, and if the life science sector, for example, is as more to say, the fact is that the life science sector is already uh, has a very different goal from other industries. Mm. 
something I think that is already selling quite well. But if you had to this, um, uh, for example, how do you respond to the 17 um, uh, SDGs from the United, Na United Nations? And, and how do you, uh, how, what you can propose to the talents arriving in the region uh, uh, beyond the, 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 the project of your company? Um, this is also a different way to, to attract them. But um, when I look at the um, digital sector, um, we see the trend is that we see more and more uh, uh, talents that are moving into the health tech sector. So there is an appetite. There is a, uh, really the, the young uh, talents today are, are quite excited to, to, to work for a biotech or medtech company. So I'm not very worried, I would say, about it. Thing. May I add one thought to what Mathieu, Mathieu just said? Is, uh, I, I very much agree with what you said. And um, before I joined Life Science Node, I was actually working uh, in, in the IT industry. Um, so a little bit of a career shift. Um, and uh, so I think one thing that fascinated me actually when I started to work for this cluster is how much each company is, is convinced and is so I want to say full of fire for what they do in life sciences and they're actually changing lives you know like whatever um, companies are producing is is potentially you know making something better and that's something i think is very important to people and is getting increasingly important to people is that actually their work is making an, an impact and um, hopefully i mean this uh, this past year, as bad as it has been, has showcased life science in a way that never, you know, had the visibility like this before to the regular people in other sectors. Mm. Um, so, so hopefully that's going to give it a push. A little bit. Will bring us, bring us even more talent now because they know what difference they can make. And it's, uh, you know, it's kind of probably been one of the times where I guess what we've heard so much about is the sort of environmental change needed. Actually, this is has really put healthcare and, and life sciences in the short window and say, well, this can make a big difference too. And uh, we need these things. But I mean, coming to you there, Brad, when you look at, you know, the different progression through a company, so someone going from starting in a company, going to middle management, and that retention piece being quite important, I guess, in that sense. Do you think there's a, a point where the roles open up in, I don't know, roles outside of the lab that grow the company, where actually the background industry that individual comes So whether it's on corporate development, and I guess finance, a lot of the, the skills that come across. But, you know, but in some of the more technical manufacturing space, they're regulated equally as heavily as life science. So is there scope for people to come from other industries into life sciences at a senior level? I think there is. I, I think it depends on the position. Um, certainly, we've done some work recently during the pandemic where we had a boot camp to train employees who were displaced during the pandemic to work in manufacturing and biotechnology, and that was successful. Um, I, I think just like, I mean, it, at the end of the day, management is management, um, and good managers can be good managers everywhere. The challenge is your depth of industry knowledge uh, over the years becomes incredibly valuable. Uh, at least as valuable as those skills you have. And we work in a remarkably complex industry. Uh, so I have seen people who are, you know, at the senior leadership level come from other industries into biotechnology or life sciences and be successful. But that's, I think in many cases, more an exception and they have to be smart enough to surround themselves with deep expertise in the field. Uh, trying to explain drug reimbursement or pricing to someone who uh, has not done this before is impossible. Uh, trying to explain why Ian can't manufacture a cell therapy for a clinical trial in a day is uh, <laughs> impossible to explain to people. Um, so I, I, I think it's possible you just have to recognize the value of that, that mm. depth of experience about the specific fields. And I think Sarah uh, and Neil and Matthew are all hitting on a very important point there. Um, the challenge with getting those people who do have those skills to relocate is um, they do have roots. Right? They've got deep roots in the communities they're in. Mm. Um, we live in a, and work in an inherently risky industry where it's not unlikely the job you're going to take is not going to be successful with nothing to do with your skill set, just because the science fails, the technology fails, or a clinical trial fails. 
And there is a critical need for there to be enough scale in the industry for people to be able to find that next job if that risk occurs. And I think that's important to think about uh, as we all look to continue to grow and develop. And two, and maybe others have seen this, we see a remarkable number of people in this industry whose spouses also work in life sciences. And so it's not just that that person you attract has to be able to find a job and feel comfortable, their spouse also has to be able to find a job, um, which, which does sort of create that need for building the density over time to, to allow that to happen. Well, I guess that's a bit, that's kind of an interesting observation, I think, is quite often we hear say, well, you've got to think about the, the spouse and the family, but it's amazing how many partners are scientists too, when I talk to people who, who move to the cluster where we are. They just work in a different company or they're in the university. And, and I think that was probably one of the challenges I was hearing a lot from our companies around Brexit. It wasn't just that they could be losing that one individual from the lab, but they're potentially losing their spouse as well somewhere in the company. Yes. <laughs> it was sort of, you know, it was a real sort of dilemma for lots of them. But, um, but no, you, you touched upon this sort of economic development strategy of diversifying out of, to the more traditional industries in, into things like health tech and life sciences. I mean, have you found that there's a, a natural synergy between those other industries or history of those industries and particular parts of life sciences? I'm, I'm kind of thinking, is it more likely that emerging clusters or environments can go into digital health and health technology and medical devices easier than they can go into biopharma R&D? Yeah, exactly. I think you partly sort of answered the question there, Tony. Um, probably the most accessible sort of subsector, if you call it, in in health technology and in, in life sciences would be in the digital health realm, where there's such a overlap of skills and in digital skills that are critically important and, and developed in in other industries. And I think where you see a strong sort of software technology industry, you'll undoubtedly see a lot of health tech and med tech being developed out because you know people are very interested in making positive impacts with their technologies and solutions that they're developing. So absolutely, I, I think, you know, we, we uh, and Calgary is no exception to that as well. We have a very strong growing digital health uh, cluster seen here. Um, and really a lot of people that had been trained in, in other sectors and other areas jumping ship to there. And, you know, I, I think Matsuo was talking about this, the impact that, that COVID has had on interest in, in the sector. And I will you know, further emphasize that um, just the uh, life sciences and, and pharmaceutical manufacturing and vaccine development being uh, on the tip of everyone's tongue and, and, and on the newsreels every day, I think has really heightened the um, uh, the the interest in 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 the sector, and particularly here in, in Calgary, where we do have an, uh, a, a number of vaccine developers and, and manufacturers here, um, and they've seen a nice overlap in in some of the skill sets that had been developed and particularly in the, the chemistry knowledge bases that existed in our traditional sectors here. They've been able to really recruit from there and, and train up individuals to now, um, you know, run uh, vaccine manufacturing uh, facility mm. here in Calgary. So I think there's definitely some low hanging fruit. It would really depend on where the traditional sort of uh, industries existed in, in a region, but for Calgary, Specifically, there was a lot of engineering uh, and a lot of chemistry knowledge, I think, which um, has has some overlap. And then, of course, the digital skills, I think, are are probably where the lowest hanging fruit is for, for overlap between um, life sciences sectors and other ones. And that convergence, Ian, does that make your job as a leader, the senior leader, more difficult? Because you're then managing diverse skill sets compared to maybe what it was even five, ten years ago. It, it, it is very different. And, you know, a lot of what Niall said really resonated with me because as we become more digital, as we become more, it, it's really all driven by large data. As we become more dependent on the analysis of that large data, we are looking to different skills groups. I mean, you, you, you I think, made a joke of, of losing perhaps bioinformaticians to, to gaming companies. Mm -hmm. But actually, I see it the other way around. I, I see the sort of strategy and the, the, the skills that they have is actually more relevant to what I want to do with that 
that data because they have a much more strategic way of thinking about how to use that data. But, but you're right, it is, it is difficult to manage. Where just just interestingly, where I tend to lose all my bioinformaticians is actually to, to supermarkets. And actually the way that they use data is something that I think we as an industry need to learn from because they are, they're very, very consumer focused. They're very mm. customer focused. Uh, and I think we just need to change that balance. But it, 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 does it make it more challenging? It probably makes it more exciting, if I'm honest, because it's, I, 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 I and I think Charles River really like a diversity of opinion and a diversity of thought, you know, and probably the most influential person in my career in life sciences, and I'm very much a biologist, was, was a, a physics teacher. And he, he just thought very differently from me and it helped me think differently about the problems that I face. You know, and building teams in, in the kind of current societal landscape, I guess, and you know, we hear the word diversity and, and inclusivity and, and, and things so much, but actually it's the diversity of thought process quite often yeah. is the hardest to see. You know, I mean, you can have a diverse, physical looking set of people, but actually if they're all University of Cambridge graduates, are they actually that diverse? If they're in the same subject? <laughs> you know, I, I, would, I would completely agree with that. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's one of the hardest to actually detect. Well, it's not, it's not hard to detect, but it's hard to nurture and always explain to the rest of the management team how you actually value that diversity of opinion, because very often they can be quite left field, but mm. I think particularly in the sector I work in, moving left field is probably where we need to be, especially yeah, when, be. Yeah. when we think about, uh, yeah. you know, patient stratification and how we personalize medicines. It really is a more strategic way of designing drugs. Mm. Yeah, and I think I've always found it I suppose intrigue, I think it was Medici that was saying innovation happens at the in intersection of those different disciplines. And you know, we're in a highly innovative field. So I guess it's it's natural it gravitates that way. But I'm conscious I'm taking up a lot of your your goodwill and, and time on the calls and, and we're we're around to only about five minutes sadly. But I'm just thinking now in a in a sense of, you know, lots of people watching this will be either in the process of building their teams and companies or, or wanting to build their careers. So if you look back at a 20-year-old a version of yourself sat next to you and you thought there was one transferable skill to make sure they were look, developing for themselves but also to put into their team, what do you think that transferable skill would be? And I'll come to Matthew. Thank you, Tony. That's a tricky question. Um, <laughs> I would say you'll have to be very uh, adaptable, flexible. Um, this is also this is um, this will resonate with what um, Niall and Ian just said about the digital transformation and this um, importance of data as well. So we we see this uh, life science sector evolving fast um, and and the the importance of data. Uh, for example, um, I think that the data will be enriched by other data. And particularly in connectivity hubs like Marseille, where you have those submarine cables arriving here, and we are already in the top 10 uh, hubs in the world for connectivity, we'll probably be in the top five soon. Today, we don't really um, understand what is the immediate value for a life science company. But I'm quite sure in a, in a couple of years, um, for this reason, it will become very uh, very important to uh, to be close to a hub like this, and to benefit for from a, a high connectivity, uh, a large bandwidth, uh, very short uh, latencies between uh, Europe and Asia, Europe and Americas, and this will be key probably in the, in the near future. Thank you, Brad. What transferable skill do you think is most valuable? Give me two. Um, one, I'm desperately thankful that I've got all my education in science and, and learning. It wasn't the science and the facts I learned themselves. I, I, my undergraduate degrees in microbiology, I would be useless in a lab. 
Um, but the, the ability to learn that scientific process and sort of continue to work at it and understand that there is a solution to any problem and the way to figure that out and the, and the process to get it done is invaluable and a skill you continue to hone through your career. And the second is sales. Um, I started my career in sales sort of unexpectedly, but you realize as you go through life that uh, that ability to uh, get people to, uh, let's say, agree with your opinion or motivate them to believe in, in the things you're trying to accomplish is critical, whether you're out trying to raise money, get your team focused on the problems at hand um, and, and to cause your company to be, to be successful. Excellent. I'll come to Ian. So, so if I was thinking all the way back to when I was 20, uh, I, I would actually go for a soft skill as well. So far, far more valuable than my degree or my PhD or, or any of my scientific skills is, is actually influencing skills. And it kind of resonates with what, what, what Brad was saying there. But thinking about all the people I've had to influence, whether it's been in, in big pharma, whether it's been in a more academic setting, whether it's been in a CRO or whether it's been, I do a lot of consulting with biotech companies, actually having the skills to adapt your style to, to influence the people that you're speaking to. And, you know, as a, as a scientist, my default is rational persuasion, just like every other scientist that was ever born. But it's realizing that doesn't always work. Mm. And you have to have a backup strategy. You have to have a different way of, of approaching it. And that is the, that's what I would tell my 20 year old self is wow. that's yeah. probably going to be the most useful skill <laughs> you'll ever have. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And Sarah. Uh, no, it works. Okay. Um, I think, I think every, every 20 year old should get you know, a little time and room to grow. So you don't have to be like already there yet at 20, but I guess um, it goes into the same direction. It's like uh, sort of an, an eye for the interdisciplinary approach. Um, I think uh, as most of us have said here, you get so focused on the pathway that you've chosen that you don't really like uh, put yourself in positions where you have to learn something completely different from what you do. And, and I think maybe forcing people a little bit to do that very early on to you know get out of their comfort zone and and get comfortable with that of being outside of your comfort zone um, i think that's important and people tend to learn that a little bit too late <laughs> and now sure yeah so lots of tremendous uh things said already but um if i were sitting next to 20 year old uh myself or i'd you know Make some encouragement just to take a dive into the the data science side of uh, of life sciences. Um, you know, I'm I'm watching so many amazing innovations come up, and it's just really scratching the surface of what we can do with the tremendous amounts of of health data that we're all holding on to, and the way personalized medicine is going and impacting every single area of medicine. Um, I'm just in awe uh, at what I'm what I'm seeing and the innovation that I'm seeing. So I think that that intersection of life sciences and, and data sciences is, is, is an area I would say from a, a technical standpoint and then maybe a, a soft skill to throw in the mix as well is in, you know, very much in line with the, with what Ian and uh, Ian was saying is the sort of the, the marketing skills and the ability to market your ideas and, and yourself to others. And so understanding how to package the information that you're trying to convey uh, to others uh, to, to make sure that it does resonate with them, that you're able to influence with them. And you know, it influences your ability to, to sell as well, whether you're selling products or you're you know, selling investment in a jurisdiction, those marketing skills come in uh, so, um, so importantly. Well, thanks everyone for all your insights. I think if I was, Picking one skill, I wish I developed sooner and actually develop any time. First of all, as you will have noticed, communication isn't one of my strong ones. I tend to not communicate it with clarity sometimes. Um, but I think that would be one thing that I just think communication drives everything. And, and, and I think that is the one theme cutting across this is, is how do you engage and, and get people to want to work with you to build your company um, and sell that vision. But, I've thoroughly enjoyed spending my extended coffee break um, picking your brains about what makes a great ecosystem and the challenges. I, I wish you well for the rest of the day or evening, depending on where you're based. 
and uh, I hope we'll catch up soon. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tony.